Hello, I'm uh, Nick Palmgarden. I'm a staff writer at The New Yorker. And uh, I'm here today to talk to and introduce uh, Michael Novogratz. Uh, Michael Novogratz is basically he's a hedge fund manager. Um, he's more than that, but <laughs> thank you for for our intents and purposes today. Hedge fund manager will do. Uh, he is the president, or a president, and a member of the board of the Fortress Investment Group. They manage a group of hedge funds, private equity funds, real estate funds, and a whole range of assets, buildings. Houses, everything. Uh, last year, Fortress, which was founded in 1998, uh, was the first of these kinds of firms to go public, uh, which, among other things, made Mike a very wealthy man. <laughs> Although uh, he's a little less of one now that uh, that uh, Fortress's share price has retreated a little bit from its high of last year. So uh, it's not quite as good, but it's pretty good. Mike is not crying in his beer. Uh, prior to joining Fortress, Mike was, uh, like Donald Rumsfeld, a uh, wrestler at Princeton, and then a helicopter. <laughs> That's funny somehow. It's the haircut. Yeah. <laughs> He's not competitive at all. I mean, uh, and then he was a helicopter pilot in the U.S. Army. Uh, he spent 11 years at Goldman Sachs, first seven years in Asia, uh, running a variety of desks there, including uh, uh, he was there during the uh, Asian financial crisis. Uh, which is an interesting place to be. Uh, he also then became head of the firm's uh, Latin American operations. He became a partner at Goldman Sachs. Um, so from these perches, you know, he's got a pretty good view of the cycles of boom and bust and boom again. Um, I'd say Mike has the mind and the metabolism of a trader, but his years of... Uh, is that an insult? I, I thought it was a compliment. I thought it was too. Uh, but, I put in a but here, his years of experience have given him a, a long view acumen and a sort of high altitude eminence. Uh, he's what you'd call a, a macro guy. Uh, he makes long term strategy, long term strategic bets on currencies or commodities or whatever. Uh, so that's pretty much why we invited him here today to give us sort of uh, the long view. Uh, so please welcome Mike Novogratz. Thank you. Uh, I thought we'd begin by asking sort of one basic question, which uh, encompasses dozens of other questions, some of which will find their way into my one basic question. <laughs> uh, the basic question is, OK, well, this, this is the statement, and there comes the question. You know, the American financial system is uh, in a bit of a mess. Um, the global marketplace is, is uh, in, in, somewhat, in some disarray. Uh, Wall Street people like to call these times uh, interesting times. They will, you know, interesting is the word meaning uh, going to hell. But uh, there's a subprime meltdown, the credit crisis, uh, the decline of the dollar, soaring oil prices, food shortages. I mean, food shortages. We're running out of food. So uh, I guess the, 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 the big question is, uh, what the hell is going on? <laughs> uh, and, and that encompasses lots of questions. You know, what, what, what's gone wrong? Who, who or what is to blame? Uh, can we get out of this mess and how? And uh, will our children be living in caves? Thank you. So, uh, well, thank you uh, for having me and uh, starting me off with such an easy question. Yeah. The, the food guys had a much okay, easier I'm, I'm gig. I'm done. I'll see you guys. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Let's, you know, that's three minutes maybe. Let's see if I can uh, make things simple. So what macroeconomic investors do, uh, actually I have a funny story. My, my daughter, when she was four, we lived in Hong Kong, and her friend's father was an ad man. And we drove by a big billboard that her father had done. She said, you know, my father, he made that ad. And my daughter looked and she says, oh, my dad just makes money. <laughs> and I, I had been a currency trader at the time, and so she thought that's what I made. Um, smart girl. <laughs> so macroeconomic investors try to take a complicated set of circumstances and make them simple, mostly because we can't keep all the complicated stories in our head. And so when I think of investing, I kind of think of three to four-year, five-year chapters, and every once in a while we get a really mega chapter. And 
so, so what happened? Before I can say why we crashed and where we're going, let me talk a little bit about how we got here. Uh, in the big picture, the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, and it was probably the most important economic event in any of our lives. And that it really started this thing called globalization. Uh, in 1989, if you thought about the world economy, there were about 400 million people that mattered in a really crass sense. 400 million people that were part of the trading system uh, that we thought of as economic participants. The Berlin Wall falls down, we open up Eastern Europe, a lot of educated workers. Uh, at the same time Tiananmen Square happens, China accelerates its economic reforms in the south. Uh, India, which used to trade solely with Russia, starts having to open up because Russia has problems. And This freedom revolution, as I like to call it, this idea that people want consumer choice, uh, you know, really to some degree led by a combination of Ronald Reagan, Maggie Thatcher and on one hand and Bill Gates and Gary Winnick on the other hand, um, unleashed this labor uh, revolution around the world. And while we talked a little bit about it through the 90s, it didn't really become part of the investment uh, lexicon to really, to really have a force until 2003, 2004. And that's because it took that long before China, really the engine, became big enough to matter. Uh, but, but in 2002, I remember sitting there uh, with my economist who said, my goodness, in 2005, China will import more than Germany. Uh, it'll be a trillion and a half dollar or two trillion dollar economy. And if you actually go back at Google search and you look for globalization, when it started really showing up, it's around 2003, 2004. Uh, and so what, what did globalization mean from a, pers from a perspective of an investor? Well, all that labor showed up, depressed the price of labor. Uh, so unions were busted both here in the US and in Europe. Uh, there was outsourcing. It wasn't the amount of outsourcing that mattered so much. It was the thought that it could happen. And so we all, we all the global markets started believing in the death of inflation. Because really it's labor inflation that drives inflation expectations. And there are a billion Chinese and a billion Indians. That's a lot of people that want to go to work. And so you thought, we can keep building new factories, and manufacturing prices will be low for a long, long time. And so from a market's point of view, inflation is really a bad thing. And so when inflation comes down, interest rates come down. When interest rates go down, asset prices go up. And so we started this very virtuous cycle, uh, integrating more people into the global economy, putting more pressure on labor prices. Uh, America owns a lot of assets. We had a lot of the capital, so it was a boom time for America. Uh, even though we were borrowing a ton of money from abroad, we were investing a lot and the investments were going up. And so the cycle kept going and volatility, you know, uh, ups and downs in all the markets started coming down. So much to the point that only 15 months ago, the smartest central bankers in the world got together for a conference and really talked about the fact that structural volatility might be low forever that this was a paradigm shift because of both structured finance, this idea of taking kind of engineering technology to the financial markets, and this idea of the death of inflation. And so from 2000, and really from March of 2003, the day we invaded Iraq, you can say the globalization era started in the markets, uh, until August of 2007, it was a wonderful time to be a hedge fund owner or an asset owner. Uh, no matter what you owned, things went up. So excesses build in that. When it seems too easy, it always is too easy. The biggest excess that we can point to is the subprime market. The subprime market was a, a combination of both financial engineering taken to a, an absurd level uh, and just the sense that prices will keep rising forever because interest rates were coming down. And so what happened? You know, Mae West said, too much of a good thing is a great thing. Well, in the case of globalization, it's not true at all. Like, too much of a good thing has put us into a, uh, a crunch time. And if you want to use internet lexicon, we went through kind of internet 1.0, and then we had the internet crash, and then there was internet 2.0. It's a little bit the same thing. We're, we finished globalization 1.0, and we finished it because those billion Indians and billion Chinese, as they got wealthier, they wanted to drive cars, they wanted more protein in their diets, they wanted to consume things. And that drive for consuming raw materials pushed up oil prices. You've seen you know, crude oil go from $22 a barrel to 126 today, uh, and food prices, and metal prices, and copper prices. 
And so we're at a point now where inflation has come back. And so the subprime crisis wasn't caused by, the sub, by subprime lending. It was caused by the fear and then the reality that inflation's come back to the world. And now that inflation has come back, and it's come back in a roaring way in the developing markets, the whole premise of this easy investing period is over. And we are going to go through a very difficult period for the next few years when the world tries to find a new equilibrium before this massive... You know, I think people always underestimate how powerful this trend is. This trend to people wanting consumer choice in markets, uh, this trend for technology being transferred easily across the world, i.e. globalization, just like the Internet's not going away. We're going to go through a period of turmoil until we reach an equilibrium, and then there's going to be a second chapter. So, so what does turmoil mean? What does difficult mean? I feel like that woman in Rambo who said, Rambo, you know, what do expendable mean? But, uh, I mean, what, what really, so there, I mean, there are difficulty big, big, is that a, it's like a euphemism almost for, for what? There are big, big challenges. That. So w we look back, and whenever you had a productivity surge like we did in the last 15 years, in the history of the world, it ended in revolution. So that's where we're starting. If I really want to get pessimistic, it ends in revolution because when you have productivity surges as fast as we're having, there's always a have-have-not problem. The gains accrue really to the top of the pyramid and very little to, to the rest. There was a great article in the FT two Saturdays ago, uh, and they showed income gain by, by uh, uh, I'm sorry, the income gain over the last six years by wealth class. And so to be a 50% income earner in America, you make around $43,000 a year. To be the 80th percentile, it's $75,000 a year. To be the 95th percentile, it's $175,000 a year. To be in the first percentile, it's $750,000 a year. The 0.1, it's 2.2 million, and the 0.01, it's 13 million. So we've always had you know, some rich people and people up the curve. What's most interesting is over the last six years, we all have this premise, well, the rich are getting richer, it's unfair. It's not the rich. Income growth in the first five categories I gave you, all 1% to 2% a year. In that top category, it's compounded at 23% a year. It's just the plutocracy. It's just the cream, the, the 0.01% that really is accruing all the gains. And we see this in every... I, I, I invest in about 120 different countries. Not, not big in all the countries, but we look at them all. Uh, in almost every country, what you call the Gini index, that gap between rich and poor is at an extreme. You know, that's not good for democracy. Uh, people are angry. They're going to fight back. We're going to see the Democrats win the House, win the Senate, win the presidency. So things have to change. What you fear from a market perspective is dumb policy response. Uh, it's protectionism. It's anti-immigration. Uh, it's, it's looking in instead of looking out. And, you know, my, my fear is that's coming. It's not coming because Barack Obama or Hillary or John McCain are dumb and they really philosophically believe. It's coming because they have to react to this outcry that they, they see. And it's coming in other countries as well. In the last six months, 34 different countries have put up food tariffs. We are starting a trade war. In the last week, three different countries put in export taxes on oil. So the, the last part of a, of a commodity boom is, is when hoarding starts. People are nervous, right? There are food riots all over the world. So, so what's, the, what's the wise response then, if not protectionism, if not these things? I mean, what's the, <laughs> what's the, the plutocrats' uh, prescription for well, know, giving, listen, giving it back or spreading it evenly? Well, to start with, right, people have to understand the problem. I, mean, I always think of the energy crises right now. Uh, people say they're, they're arguing at the energy crisis. The, po the politicians' response should be, guys, get used to it. Oil is going to be $120 a barrel or higher for a wire for a while, so we have to actually have smart policy response and react, right? There's got to be a move towards conservation. There's got to be a move towards green energy. We've got, a, we've got a political system that is very provincial and not global. I had a, a, senator in my off, a senatorial candidate in my office two weeks ago, and I asked him about what he thought about cap and trade, and he didn't know what I was talking about. And I, I got angry. I was like, we can't have... Our, our political system not be integrated into these global issues. Um, there's, there's a lot of things you could do short-term that just won't happen. Allowing sugar imports, 
but we have a, a sugar lobby in, right, in right. Florida. Uh, Brazilian ethanol. Right. Um, well, let's just assume, because there's some historical antecedent for this, that things will more or less stay the same for the next 20 years in terms of the political system, more or less, you know, within usual parameters. Um, where, where will we be? Where will the financial system be in 20 years? Where will, will, will Wall Street still be Wall Street as we know it? Will the American financial system still be the big gorilla that it is? Or are we sort of, are we at the beginning of a long, slow decline? You know, it's interesting. So <laughs> people ask all the time, why do those Wall Street guys make so much money? You know, they're not that smart. Um, if you had taken my graduating class in college in 1987, and you said, I got a crystal ball. I'm going to show you what the world looks like in 20 years, 21 years, I'm getting older. Um, and you saw all these people working in China and this technology boom in India. And if, if you actually saw it all and you said, there's going to be this thing called globalization, what job do you want? All the hands would have said, I want to work at Procter & Gamble because there'll be a billion people using toothbrushes. Or I want to work at Coca-Cola. People would have thought consumer products. Very few would have said, I want to work at Goldman Sachs. Because this move of globalization is going to create, we had 400 million people in the economy, now we have 1.8 billion. All these savers. And more importantly, the wealth is accumulating in resource-rich countries with, with not a lot of places to spend the money. So places like Dubai and Abu Dhabi and uh, Russia, you have this huge resource gain. And in Asia, where the manufacturing booms happen, where there's a real culture of saving. And so you have this giant excess savings in the world that needs to get invested. Well, lucky us, us Wall Street guys, there's only real two universities of investing, New York and London, where there's a history of training people how to invest, where there's a history of you know, understanding global flows in finance. Uh, when I first went out to Asia for Goldman Sachs, uh, and I was trading the Asian local markets, and the Asian crises happened, there were times I almost felt guilty, because I was like, <laughs> this is like a a trained boxer fighting a, a high school kid. And they were lovely kids, and it wasn't that they were not s as smart as us, they just had no context. And you don't build a generation of financial acumen uh, 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 in, one, in, in, one, in one generation, right? It will take three to four generations before Shanghai is a global financial center or Dubai is a global financial center. And so the world is in this great disequilibrium right now. Quite frankly, there is a lot more demand for our services than there is supply of it. And so Wall Street is getting paid these enormous sums in general, not because they're manipulating the system or there's some, there's some conspiracy. It's because there's this supply-demand imbalance that the guys like me pick the right career mostly out of sheer luck where you know, there is far more demand for, for, for money being invested than there is supply of people that can do it. So that means that I guess in 20 years we're still going to... So New York... New and York Wall Street exist. is going to thrive. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the alternative asset management business, the asset management business will be a booming business and will be a big driver of this economy. Listen, like in any business, you have your booms and busts and, you know, people get excited. And if you look at last year, I think the, the wealth created by, you know, some of the successful guys in the worst market, you know, three billion, four billion, two billion, you know, this is... It really is a monumental, you know, legacy wealth created in one year. You know, you can't find a, a, a period of history where you, you find that almost anywhere. Even the internet boom didn't create cash wealth like the, the Wall Street booms created. And so, yes, it got a little excessive, but it's a mega trend uh, that's going to be here for a while. But the mega trend is, is one of general slowing, you know, Americans slowing, but it just more gradual. Well, like, so, like, you know, how human beings live longer now and they've learned how to... If, you, if right. you look at not just Wall Street, but you look at America's place in the world and something the politicians don't deal with, it's not hype, it's not uh, conjecture, it is fact that we will become less relevant to the global economy every day, right? For the rest of our lives, every day, America will become less relevant. It doesn't mean irrelevant, it doesn't mean not important, just less relevant. And so in 15 years and 20 years, we're going to be a lot less relevant than we are today. It's just the rest of the world has decided they want to participate in the American dream. We actually brought all this on ourselves. You know, we knocked down the Berlin Wall. We, want, we started the technology revolution. And, you know, now, I think from a global perspective, it's a great, it's a great gig. Yeah. We're going to become less relevant. 
the real challenge is that transition's happening so fast. And how do you create a social safety net? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you retrain workers? Uh, you know, how do you compete in a global, a global world? It is going to be a very difficult, you know, challenge both politically uh, and, listen, your fear as an investor is we don't rise to the challenge. My hope is uh, that we will. You know, I was in the Mideast uh, two weeks ago. And so hold this thought. If you take the oil in the ground in the Mideast and you multiply it by $100 a barrel, today oil's at $126 a barrel, but let's just use 100 That number uh, is bigger than the market capitalization of every stock market in the world and every bond market in the world combined. It is a breathtaking number, right? We are transferring $800 billion a year of wealth to the Mideast. Uh, it's, a, it's an area where there are not a lot of cultures and societies that, that an American will show up in a Western sensibility and say, I really like this place. Listen, you can go to China, and there are problems with China, but 80% of what you see resonates. It's hardworking, it's industrious, they're creating things. You say, this is the American dream. There are plenty of issues. Uh, you go to the Middle East and you say, these broadly group of people are really lucky that they, they live on top of dead dinosaur bones. And so, if you take that art, uh, argument to the absurd, we're not going to let the Mideast own the whole world. You know, as oil goes up, there is going to be a green revolution that shows. It's already started. And so when I think about what's going to be the, the next driver of the American economy, it's probably going to happen out in Silicon Valley. It's probably going to be green energy. Uh, there will be a green bubble, just like there was an internet bubble, because it's going to be a necessity. It's, and it's not because of Al Gore. He's certainly going to help. It's not because of the the pollution side, it's because of the energy side, right? Oil will go to $200 a barrel, uh, and gas will go to $10 a gallon, and we're going to need to do something about it. And so or, that, I think, is a huge growth opportunity for America. Or maybe we should just uh, stage an invasion in the Middle East. Or Take we're going to have a war. Oh. Yeah. It's, listen, Another that's the one. way these things end. We will, we will, the world will not let the Mideast own everything. Again, take that argument taken to the absurd, we will either have a war and really take the oil, or we'll have a, a, you know, a war of economics and, and, and create an alternative. And you know, let's all you know, pray it's the latter. Yes, because we don't want to be living in caves. <laughs> we don't want to live in their caves. We don't want to live in their or caves. Or our own caves. Anyway, our time is up. It was not a, not a very long time. There's still a few issues out there in the world economy that we haven't tackled, but tune in next year for the uh, sequel. Anyway, thank you.